Good afternoon and welcome to San Juan's Digital Edge. My name is Laura Lida and I'm a teacher on special assignment with Technology Services in San Juan. Today our guest is Nicole Naditz and she is a teacher at Bella Vista High School. And Nicole's going to be talking to us about Google tools to support student learning. Welcome to our show, Nicole. Thank you. I know you've got a lot of information to share with us today and Google has a lot of different things that it can do. Mm -hmm. And so we're really excited. Let's just go ahead and dig right in. Okay, perfect, because we'll be going very quickly. So the first thing I wanted to start with were some different ways that you can reach me in case you have questions about any of the tools I'll be sharing today. Great. Um, so, of course, you have email and Twitter if you're on Twitter, which, as you know, you can private message that way as well. You can check out the blog or the Google Tools website I created that has some tutorials and including video tutorials on how to use some of the tools I'll be talking about today. And then you can also feel free to visit my class website. So all of that is here for you. Great resources for our viewers. Now, one of the things I will start with is an actual product of Google Docs. Google Docs has uh, three components, Google Docs kind of like Microsoft Word, Google Forms, and Google Presentations. I actually created this presentation on Google Presentation. Which is nice because our students can do that too. Yes. Our students all have Google accounts and they can create presentations and share through the same way that you're doing today. Exactly. And in fact, they can even collaborate with each other so they mm -hmm. don't have to be in the same room at the same time. They can actually work on their presentations off, time, off school time as well. Perfect. Um, one of the things you can do is you can use the Forms feature of Google Docs to create quick checks for understanding, formative assessments, exit tickets, and so on, that students can complete either on a computer or on a cell phone or a tablet, a Nook, anything with um, Wi-Fi capability so that they can access the form. So if they brought their own device to school, they could mm -hmm. use those devices. Yes, and in the school where I'm at, that's particularly important. We have 2,000 students and one cow, so I sometimes depend on my students' devices mm -hmm. to allow us to maintain our connection. Our viewers might not know that a cow is computers on wheels. True. I think sometimes they get confused. <laughs> we have a cow at school? I don't have a cow at Bella Vista. <laughs> For, no, not, not the pasture kind. Um, so it's part of Google Docs. So it's already built into your account. Uh, as I said, you can use any device with Wi-Fi or Internet access to do it. And it can be automatically graded if it is something that you would like to see results from, particularly if you do it multiple choice. Mm -hmm. So what happens is you basically go into either Google Docs or Drive, depending on your account, click on Create, choose Form, and edit the fields. However, if you would like this to automatically be graded, you will want to make sure that the first question is, what is your name, or right. something similar. Right, you have to know who, who's doing it. And you have to tell the grading program where the names are. Otherwise, it can't do the grading. Right. So auto-grade is done with a thing called a script. And in this program today, we can't talk too much about those, so I'm just going to very quickly show you the name of the script, which is Flubaroo. And what it can do is actually automatically grade student responses by taking your teacher answers as the key and then comparing all the student responses against them. Um, so you download the script while you're in the spreadsheet view of your form, and there are detailed directions on my class in the cloud website mm -hmm. for how to do this. And it kind of looks like this. These are actually three steps. Once now you run the script. that's a funny word, Flubaroo. <laughs> I know, and it's the name that the script writer made up. Oh, okay. So there are all kinds of people all over the world writing scripts for Google. If mm -hmm. you know how to do script, if your students know how to do script, they can submit scripts to Google to be included in the script gallery. Mm -hmm. Scripts basically allow... Um, you to tell the Google tool to do certain things at certain times. So it's kind of like a program. So it's telling them to grade this. Yes. Whatever And it puts it in all the different stuff that, don't be scared because I don't know how it works either. It puts in all the stuff that Google's, the, the Google Forms program needs in order to interpret the student's answers and grade them against mine. Mm -hmm. So it's basically a three-step process. It's going to ask you um, first to identify which column tells me who the different students are. And so it's a spreadsheet, so you just say X column. Mm -hmm. And then, it's going to, oops, and then it's going to ask which one should I use as the key. That's why the teacher has to do it. Mm -hmm. And then on the bottom of this screen, you can see that it actually then gives, gives back a new version of the spreadsheet that's color coded now. Mm -hmm. And the color codings tell me two different things. Um, individual students who scored less than 75% are highlighted in red, but whole columns are highlighted in orange if less than 75% of the class got that question right. So yeah. this is really valuable data for teachers who need quick access to know how a whole class is doing and which individual students need more support. And then can modify their, their instruction yes, to exactly. meet the students' needs. Exactly. Which is barely why we want to do you know, assessments yes. in the first place. Yes. So that we can actually help our students. Exactly. 
So that's, again, something you can look at on the mm -hmm. tutorials to get more information on how to do that. One really important thing, if students will be accessing this on a portable device, is to make, the, make it accessible using either a QR code generator or a URL shortener so that they don't have to type in a really, really, really long address to do that. And so I've given some information here on exactly how you can make short URLs and QR codes at the same time and then the, the students teacher just can, uses their or the student and uses the student. device mm -hmm. points it at the QR yes. code and it takes them right to where they need to yes. be. Yes. So those of you if you were to be watching if you're watching this right now and have a QR code reader on your device, you can pause this video, scan that QR code and if all goes well it should pop you right to one of my forms. But it's in French. I think. It might not I help a lot form. of people. <laughs> I don't remember which form that actually is too now. Another use for forms, I just tried this actually two weeks ago and it worked really, really well. I created a form to collect homework. Right. I wanted my students to practice one piece of the advanced placement exam where they have to simulate writing an email response. Uh -huh. So I could have had them all email me and gotten several different emails, but I kind of wanted them all in the same place. So what I did was I created a form that only had two fields, their name and their answer. Then I embedded that form into my class website, and that's what this screenshot is. Mm -hmm. So when the students went to the homework page of the website, they could do their homework right there. But when they were done, what I got was a spreadsheet with all their answers in one place. Wow, that's nice. And then I typed back on the left column that's red, I took out where it says their name, and I actually typed back feedback to each of them, but now they can look at each other's forms and see what kinds of responses. By AP, they're very trusting. They know each other very, very well. So mm -hmm. we're used to sharing our work with each other, and they can actually look at the feedback everybody got on all the different letters and how different students responded to the same prompt. So they can learn from each other, which yeah. is a really nice feature here. And having it all in one place must make yeah. your life a whole lot simpler. I love this. Not having separate pieces of paper that you have to put in your book bag and exactly. take home the grade. And I'll, I'll be doing this again. It worked really smoothly. And this is using the district's website template for teachers. I was mm -hmm. able to embed the code for the form right into the homework right, page. Right, because you can. In school world, mm -hmm. you can embed that code right in there. Exactly. Um, another thing I've done with Google Forms is pre and post tests. So mm -hmm. on a topic, we were learning about a culture that lives in a part of the French speaking world. So I asked them questions about the culture in French. That's above the red line. You can see their mm -hmm. answers. And then as you look below the red line, what were all different answers above, now everybody seems to have the same answer. That's because it's the same questions on the post test. And it showed me and confirmed for me that they actually had learned the material um, because now they actually know the answers to the questions about this culture. Perfect. You really can keep it so organized this way. Absolutely. Another Google tool that I'm still experimenting with, but that is really interesting for perhaps capturing students' thoughts and questions, um, not necessarily calling on people in class, and sometimes the students who might be shy to share their ideas and so on in class, is to use Google Moderator. Um, Google Moderator is a place where you can post either questions or ideas and others can reply to them. So it creates kind of a feed, mm -hmm. almost like the kinds of feeds you see in Facebook and in other social media sites where there's comments all on the same topic. You can create your own at google.com slash moderator. If you want to try one, you can go to the one here using either the short URL or the QR code I've given you. By the way, with short URLs, Capitalization does matter. Often in URLs it doesn't, but in the short URLs it does. And it actually kind of looks like this. You see um, a topic, and then the most popular responses float to the top, actually. Mm. Um, and people can choose to vote for comments or questions they particularly like. So it can also be a way to have students ask questions about a lesson so that you can see what questions they have. And if someone already asked a question that you had, for example, you could just click the check mark, say, hey, that was my question too. And the biggest mm -hmm. questions in a lesson will then pop to the top of the list. Good. And then as a teacher, you can say, oh, these are the most important ones for me to get to tomorrow or exactly. whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A couple of searching things. The, the first one has nothing to do with Google, but I found in the various places I've gone in conferences where I'm a participant as well as in places where I'm a presenter that a lot of people are actually unaware of Control F. And so it's really important that everybody understand control F. And what that does is by hitting control on your computer and then F, and perhaps in Mac it might be command F. Mm -hmm. You might want to experiment with that. Um, you can actually then see a little tiny search bar up here so you can search for content on any page that you're on and in most programs as well. It mm -hmm. will work, like Microsoft Word, for example. The reason this is important is, as you might know, when you go into Google search and you type in a search term, you end up sometimes with a very long list of results and you click on one and when you open it, it doesn't seem to have what you were searching for, yet Google thought this had the thing you were searching for. So hit Control-F, type your search term in again, and it will bring you right to 
the place in that document where this search term is that you used. So you figure out why Google thought that. Yes, and place. then you can decide if it is in fact a relevant um, result. Mm -hmm. Another thing that is is can be quite useful in Google is it now it's changing all the time and the way Google search works is changing all the time and one of the things they do now is you can type in conversions and instead of bringing you to a page of results it actually as you can see on the bottom of my screen just gives you the answer mm -hmm. and that can be um, that can be very helpful depending on what kinds of things you're doing for my students I don't necessarily need them to know all the time how to convert from the metric system and so on I'd like them to be aware of it but if they just need the information so they can continue on with whatever they're writing about or talking about they can quickly go get those conversions mm -hmm. I think a lot of us are aware of Google Maps. I don't use Google Earth as much because that requires a download, and now they've changed Google Maps to the point where you can do almost everything it's amazing, you, could do, you could do on Google Earth, right. and all you need is internet. You don't have to download it to every device. You have to have a program on your... Exactly. Yeah. So, Especially important when kids are bringing their own devices, then you'd have to make sure everybody had it on there. And it was compatible, and a lot of devices right. can't handle. And in fact, the mobile version of Google Earth is quite a bit more limited than the desktop yeah. and computer version. So the things I would want to do don't even work, don't work on the on mobile there, version. Yeah. So a lot of us have searched for our houses and so on, and you can also use Street View on Google Earth if you're going to a new place and want to know what that restaurant is, at, what it looks like that you're meeting for dinner. I want to know what my hotel looks like. Yes. But I also want to know what's around yes. my hotel so I don't walk outside and go, ooh, this yes. is not what I thought. <laughs> and so we've used it personally, but we can actually also use it in education. For example, we can connect students to literature, yeah. um, whether it's where the author lived or whether it's the places where the literature takes place. Correct. When I used it in history to take us to places where things happened, events happened. Was that was great. my next one. So you could yeah. use it for history. And in fact, they actually have a really interesting time feature now. I'm not sure if you're aware, but you can go back in time. Street yes. View doesn't, I mean, the Street View section is generated. It's not actual photos most of the time and right. so on. It's, it's generated by computer. And you can also use it. Students can tell original stories. They can actually pin pictures and text to places. Mm -hmm. They can use other tools like Animaps to then make a path from place to place. And they can then use screen capturing software and a microphone to record themselves telling their story, opening up the pictures and I pins. I was born here, and then I yes. moved to this place. Yes. And I, oh, that's Whether it's fictional, real, whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This one excites me. <laughs> I just learned about this when I was down at the Q conference, and oh, I was good. Just so excited about this because I would like to be my own curator of my own exhibit. This is a could. great thing. I know I can. <laughs> I'm so excited about it. And now you can. Google Art Project is accessible at googleartproject.com, mm -hmm. and what they did was they used the same tools as Street View, which if any of you have seen that, it's a, it's a car in... In most cases, it's a car with a really interesting 360-degree camera, drives down the street, capturing everything as it goes. Mm -hmm. um, and then they upload that, and that's how you get your street view. Right. Well, what they did was they took bicycles, put the cameras on that, and rode through some of the best museums in the world and captured every piece of art, which then had to be cataloged and set up in a way so that you could search for it. Mm -hmm. So they captured art and art museum all over the world with really high-quality images. The images are absolutely stunning, so I encourage you, you to go check it out. really closely. Oh, so if gorgeous. you want to really see just a certain part of the, pic of the photograph mm -hmm. or the painting. Or those it's detail shots. Just so and I believe the resolution stays intact. It does. It doesn't have any pixelation at no. all. Gorgeous. It's just impressive. And if you want to see the stroke work, for example, if it's if a you're painting. An art teacher, yeah. Yes. Um, and it's searchable. Mm -hmm. You can search by artists, you can search by artworks, and you can, it has galleries, for example, by museum and so on, but you mm -hmm. can actually pick and choose from different artists, different museums, and so on, and create your own gallery that is then connected to your own units of study. I apologize for the typo, but to complement units of study. Mm -hmm. A couple of more interesting search options that I don't think a lot of people are aware of that they might want to use. One of them that I really like to tell teachers about is Google Custom Search. What this does is it allows you to create your own custom search engine. Mm -hmm. And I know what you're thinking, which is, Google's a great search engine, why do I need to create my own? Well, I can say as a French teacher, you might have certain specific things that would only be relevant to what the content is that you're teaching. Mm -hmm. And you don't need access to all the millions of right. other pieces. That's exactly right. So mm -hmm. this helps you limit the results that the students get mm -hmm. when they type in those search terms. And you might want to limit it for content. You might want to limit it for age appropriateness, for example, in the elementary school and for reading levels and so on. And you might want to limit it to ensure that everything's on topic. 
You might also want to limit it to ensure that there's no misinformation represented because this particular lesson isn't about evaluating the validity of the site. You just want them to get to the information. Mm -hmm. So you can actually, and it's quite easy, you can create your own search engine where you put in the websites that you've already selected. And when students then enter their search terms, the only results they'll get will be the results from the websites you have vetted. But it's, it's very nice to be able to keep the kids in a kind of a sandbox type situation. Sometimes it is. I mean, for primary grades, I mean, high school yes. kids, they go to Google all the time, but my right. little ones, right. they would get lost. Yes. They would go here. And, and they, they wouldn't would know which there. one to click on. They wouldn't know. And, <laughs> and they would just, you know, get somewhere that I had no idea how they got there. Right. So a waste of time. So mm -hmm. this is much better for that. This can be much better for that. And as I said, for example, in my case as a French teacher, I might want to ensure that, well, first of all, they're learners of the language. And so that can be very difficult for them mm -hmm. when they hit authentic sites that were written for native French speakers. The content might just be overwhelming. So I can search for sites that are more closely related to their language level, mm -hmm. and also sites, for example, that are only in French and don't have an option to, to change it to English, right. so Cheat. that they have to use their French in order to accomplish the task. True. There are a variety of reasons to use this. Yeah. Um, I do have tutorials on this as well on the website, because mm -hmm. there's a little bit of work you have to do. Google Voice, don't get scared. When, I, when you see what I say you can do with this, it's OK. Um, Google Voice is a phone number that runs through Google. So mm -hmm. it's kind of like an internet-based phone number, but it works like any phone number. Right. You can call it, you can leave messages on it, and people can text it. Mm -hmm. Why would I want to do that as a teacher? Well, they can call me without having my cell number or text me at any time, and I will get a notification on my cell phone because I downloaded Google Voice to my phone. It does not ring there. I turned off the forwarding, and I'll explain why. Um, I will get an, a notification on my iPad. I'll get notifications in my Gmail um, that tell me. And so um, it's great for short audio responses in English language arts, which I, you correct me if I'm wrong, but if I recall correctly, in the new Common Core Standards, there's also a somewhat more emphasis on spoken language mm -hmm. as well. And so this is a great way to start collecting evidence of your student's ability to speak mm -hmm. um, on various topics. It's great for facilitating homeschool communication because there's more ways. You're just giving one more way that parents and students can reach you. And you can turn on the forwarding to your cell phone, which can be great for things like field trips, because then anybody can reach you and still without having your phone number. Oh, so you're on the field trip. Yes. And so it will actually ring Johnny's on my phone. Johnny's mother needs to get a hold of Johnny because he forgot to take his medication or right. something with him. She can call you and yes. get a hold of you. Yeah. Absolutely. Without having your home phone number or exactly. your cell phone number. That's exactly. Good idea. And you can see on the screenshot, one thing I did recently, I was out at a meeting where I was working with a state panel, and the students were watching a portion of a film, and I kind of wanted to know what they thought of it. And it wasn't required or anything. I just sent out a text message with another tool called Remind 101. I don't have any of my students' phone numbers. So I used a different tool. And I, all, I invited them to text me back at my Google Voice number and just tell me what they thought of it, you know, and so on. And as you can see from the screenshot, they actually all automatically texted back in French, which I loved, mm -hmm. um, and gave me some feedback. And actually, this was the most successful one ever. I've never seen a group of students get so incredibly excited about a film I've chosen. That's great. <laughs> Search literature. They, they brought, it, brought it home to watch with their families. Oh, wow. um, Search literature with Ngram viewer. This is really interesting. This compares two terms over time. So this is probably something you're going to see more in high school and in probably even in the more advanced classes in high right. school, like literature and history and so on. And what it does, in my case, I compared the two French words for Holocaust. Mm -hmm. One is Holocaust, which sounds a lot like Holocaust, and the other is the Hebrew word Shoah. And in recent times, Shoah has absolutely taken off in usage, and Hol Holocaust has almost gone away. And you can see that on the graph you get back. Mm -hmm. And you can also see by date when that change started to happen, which can lead to some really interesting research and discussions about what was going on in the world that caused that shift. this shift. So it's a very advanced kind of tool for mm -hmm. some really deep analytical study and so on, but some teachers might find it useful. YouTube is a Google product. Correct. And so you can actually do some really interesting things by annotating your lesson videos. Um, so that even if you have a video of your lesson, you can add annotations that pop up information during the video, that ask them a question, that tell them to pause and do something, or that link them to related content. Mm -hmm. So that's also in the tutorial. And I know that uh, YouTube has done some um, additions to their site where you can actually edit your video right on YouTube now. Yes. So that's I really do. exciting. And that's where I do the annotations, actually. Right on there. Yes. Oh. You have to be signed in um, mm -hmm. in my in either with your San Juan GAFE account or if you have a private Gmail account. Um, then you have to be signed in to do so, and you mm -hmm. go to your uploaded videos, and you can do all those annotations, including links to other YouTube right videos. Right there. 
and then save the, the your your code and embed yeah. it in your website. If you you want can to, embed or? it in your website. You can send it out in an email or and so on. That's really handy. And it can really help, especially for teachers that are starting to do the flipped classroom concept, right. or at least blended, even blended, and starting to provide some video content. Mm -hmm. You can then link to related content that others have posted. You can do all kinds of great things with students doing choose your own adventure videos, mm -hmm. which is a whole other topic. And I want our teachers out there to know that I'm going to be doing four days this summer on the flipped classroom model. Awesome. And we'll be you know, exploring some of these tools in more depth at Excellent. that time. Yeah. Excellent. And uh, Google Chrome is the web browser that Google created. If you use Google Chrome as your browser, there are a lot of things you can do to make your experience a lot more fluid. So you can add apps and extensions that are available on any computer that is connected to the internet when you sign into Chrome. That mm -hmm. way your experience looks the same and the browsers do the same thing every time you're on any computer, public, your own, and so on. All you have to do is sign into Chrome. So one new feature of docs and presentation that people might not have noticed has come up is the research bar. I didn't know about this. The research bar is brand new. Um, it used to come up automatically. Now you have to search for it. I believe it's in tools. And what it does is uh, in your doc, which kind of looks like a Microsoft Word document, you can pop open your research bar and a window appears on the right. And it's a search window, like a Google search. And mm -hmm. it gives you some options. Would you like to search images, quotes, scholarly, or the web? Put in your search terms. Once you find what you want, it is both inserted into where your cursor is in the document with the appropriate bibliographic citation. So it cites it for you. Yes. Gosh, that would have been nice during my master's, I'll yes. tell you. Yes, <laughs> exactly. I had to learn all about how to do that. Oh, yes, really, and in three different styles, depending yeah, on which part of your really program you were in. Yeah, complicated. <laughs> Oops, and wow, we're done. Wow, people are go back. really exciting yeah. that people are able to do that now. Yes, yeah. Pretty easy. So wherever your cursor is? Yes, it say? puts it in wherever your cursor is. And at that point, um, you could move it and so on. So if I inserted an image, then it would cite that where the image came from? Down yes. Oh, that's nice. Yes, uh, appropriately formatted. I believe they chose MLA. For, oh, no, I believe you can choose. So check, I think you can choose APA or MLA. So kids actually can... Or Chicago can, Manual uh, style. Teachers, when kids do that, can find out where they get those images or, or that yes. citation. And it helps encourage the students to, in fact, properly cite. Mm -hmm. um, also, in Google search, as you know, if you can go into advanced search, you can actually search for things that are free to use and share so that you, and teach your students to do mm -hmm. the same thing mm -hmm. so that it, they are discouraged from doing things that are, in fact, against copyright law and are only mm -hmm. selecting images, for example, mm -hmm. that have been put up there freely available for us to use in our projects and in our work. That's really nice because yeah. I think that's one of the things that... As educators, we might not spend quite enough time mm -hmm. with just talking to kids about fair use yes. and copyright and making sure that they understand that just because they found it on the Internet, it doesn't mean it's theirs to use freely. Or that it's right even, but yes, so exactly. It could be incorrect information. Yes, and the, the free use aspect is critically important, I agree. I think it's hard on for all of us as teachers. Mm -hmm. It's easy to forget to really Especially with images, that. I think that... That's, you know, you just find a picture and you, we yes. so many ways just to get that picture yes. and insert it, but it's not, it doesn't belong to you. No. There's somebody who took that picture or no. drew that drawing and you need to be able to cite that where you got that if it's permissible. Exactly. And so Google search, you have to go under advanced search and then you scroll almost all the way to the bottom of the page. I wish they right. made it a little easier. Yeah. And then when you finally get there, you can actually choose type of results and free to use, yeah. you know, Copyright free and so to on. Use. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's great. Yes. That advanced search feature, I think, is really um, uh, uh, very useful. It's, but it's, I don't think people know c where it is because it's like that little over on the side. It's on the side. Yeah. And then even when you get there, there there's mm -hmm. a whole page. And more than a page, you have to scroll down to see all of the advanced search mm -hmm. options. So well, I will also time. be teaching people how to do advanced Good. searching <laughs> this summer. So be sure to uh, look in your uh, electronic register online for those courses that are going to be happening this summer. Excellent. Excellent. Mm -hmm. And do you have any other questions about the other uh, about the well, other I, tools? I, know, I just or one I, I wanted think, to go back to. Well, I, or that you I had wanted. learned one um, this summer also when we oh, went to a Google Slam about <laughs> um, the archives, the history. You can oh, nice. Find, you can find all kinds of documents, historical documents, by just when you do your advanced search, putting in a time frame. Oh, nice. And it takes you right to the primary source document itself. Oh, that's amazing. And for example, I I wanted to search for something on the Titanic, so I just put my my timeline, right. 1912 to 19, you know, 30. Sure. It took me to newspaper articles Beautiful. from that time period that I could actually 
you know, read, pr print out, use in, in my instruction. Mm -hmm. I think that was a very handy new feature that I had. And you said that's under that. timeline, under advanced search, where you Some can put searching. in time parameters. Yeah, well, you can put in time parameters in, in the advanced search area. Yeah. And or if you type in Google Archives, and yes. it will also take you there to yes. a place where they'll give you the the ability to, to put the times in there. And that's true about a lot of Google tools. If you mm -hmm. can't remember how to get to them, just go to Google and search for the tool mm -hmm. or for the particular ability. That's, that that's you want. true. So and I know that you use a lot of these tools in your yes. daily instruction. Which one do you find that you're using on a, on a daily basis or, uh, or at least I weekly basis? You know, well, what's interesting is there are so many tools out there that I actually use quite a huge blend that includes some Google tools and a lot of other tools as well. Mm -hmm. So it's not necessarily that I, I'm very careful, in fact, about choosing a, a particular tool for the right purpose at the right time. Right. So the Google tool that I think I've used the most are different aspects of search mm -hmm. as well well as uh, some of the other ones, the forms the actually. Forms. I use the that every forms day. Is, are really easy, both between being able to collect homework or whether I want to get a quick gauge of how students are doing, or even if I want an opinion about something, mm -hmm. I can use the forms in that way too. And I think once teachers use them once or twice, they start to see they are quite easy to create. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's really easy to be successful with the forms, especially mm -hmm. if you remember to actually. Um, go ahead and make those tools accessible with the right. QR code. And when, when you are using the form, it, it gives you the ability to say, make this question required. Yes. So that they have to they answer it. They have to that. answer it. That's when you put their name in there. If you really yes. want to know who, they, who yes. gave you the answer, you can make that a required field. Yes. And that's that's really helpful. But I love the fact that after they complete the form, it goes right into a spreadsheet. Yes. For you to be able to aggregate all that information and have mm -hmm. that for your students is is really important. And so it's important for them to check and make sure they're sharing the live form and not the spreadsheet mm -hmm. version when they go to create their thing. To the, for the mistake a lot of teachers make is to accidentally share the link to the spreadsheet instead of the link to the form itself for mm -hmm. students to use. And I want our viewers and our teachers to know that we are very lucky in our district that we have access to Google Apps for Education, yes, which means that every one of our San Juan students has a Google email account and is able to access the docs and the mm -hmm. forms and the spreadsheets mm -hmm. and the presentation. You know, a lot of districts don't no, have that don't. ability to do that. And so our students really have the ability to collaborate, which is a huge part of the Common Core. Mm -hmm, absolutely. And communicate with each other. Presentation of knowledge and ideas mm -hmm. is one of our anchor standards. So as we learn more about Google, I think our district's going to be using it more, more and, and more. more. I agree. So I'd like to thank all of you for joining us today for San Juan's Digital Edge, where we bring cutting edge information to you about what's happening in San Juan. Thank you, and thank our guest, Nicole, for joining us today. Thank you. It was a pleasure.